Praise the Lord, everybody, and happy Feast of Pentecost. Now, this day represents the salvation of Israel. Israel will be saved. That doesn't mean every single person, but Israel will be saved. The Bible says Israel will be saved in the book of Romans. And this pictures that time when Israel will be saved. Now, I'm talking about saved as a nation. Now, the first converts, of course, to Christianity were Jews. They were Israelites. So the church began as a Jewish church. Amen. But I'm talking about Israel being the first fruits of the nations. And we know that in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, all nations will come up to Jerusalem to learn about the Lord and for the Israelites to teach them his ways. You know, God is a God of new beginnings. We see that. Uh, it's, it's so touching to me because we see the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. You know, he cried out. He, he told the Israelites, he told Judah, the northern kingdom had already been taken captive by the Assyrians. But then, you know, in, in 721 B.C., but in 586 B.C., then the Babylonians came and they conquered Judah. Now, they didn't conquer it in a day. It took a while. Uh, they weren't con totally conquered, but Nebuchadnezzar came. He burned the temple. He took some of the uh, articles from the temple that were needed for worship. He was stopping the worship. And, you know, God was very compassionate, but he kept saying through the prophet Jeremiah that these people, they're, they're not repenting. And because they're not repenting, I'm going to give them over into captivity. And that seems like that's a very ominous thing, doesn't it? Except in this whole period of time when uh, Jeremiah is prophesying, and of course he's dealing with a, a false prophet also named Hananiah, who was saying, oh, never mind, things are going to be well. Within two years, the, you know, those articles are going to be back. They'd put a yoke on, uh, on Jeremiah, uh, a yoke of wood, and he took the yoke off of Jeremiah in front of the king and in front of uh, all the dignitaries there, and he broke that yoke, and he said, this is what God's going to do to the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And within two years, his yoke, is, is, he's going to be broken like this yoke, and he's going to bring the articles that he's taken back to us. Well, Jeremiah said, well, speak on, speak on, speak on, keep on, come on, keep on talking, you know. And uh, everybody's listening to you. You're saying sweet words, but let me tell you something. Uh, you know, what's going to happen to you is you're going to have a yoke of iron that cannot be broken. And you're going to die, by the way, because you're speaking lies. And what Jeremiah had to say to the king and to Judah, listen, God's not going to change his mind. Now hear this. God's not going to change his mind. You're going to serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Now he didn't tell them what was going to happen after 70 years. Except that he said you will you will be allowed to go back to Jerusalem and build the temple. But what really did happen after 70 years? Well, in 70 years, they were no longer subjects of Babylon. Why? Because the Medo-Persian Empire took over Babylon. And so for those first 70 years, they were subject to the Babylonians and to the king of Babylonians. They were mere subjects to them, whether they were living in Babylon or whether they were living in the land of Palestine, they were under the authority and rule of the king of Babylon. After that, the Medo-Persian Empire took, uh, gained power, conquered Babylon, and then Daniel and all everyone else served the king, King Darius, later King Cyrus. See? And it was under King Cyrus, that, which was prophesied by Jeremiah, that that the Israelites, a remnant of them, a remnant, were allowed to go back. Ezra, Nehemiah, Joshua, Zerubbabel, among others, were able to go back and rebuild a modest temple. And you know the story. When the temple was built, the young men shouted for joy because they hadn't seen the former temple. 
They hadn't seen Solomon's temple. But the old men that had seen Solomon's temple, they wept because by comparison, the house was not near as glorious as that magnificent wonder of the world. And people came from all over the world to see the temple uh, that Solomon built and to hear the wisdom that God had given him. But after the Medo-Persian Empire, then here comes Greece. And now the priests had to go out to meet Alexander the Great. And they, they showed him in the scriptures where the scriptures, their scriptures spoke of him and that he would gain power and that he would shatter. They showed him the book of Daniel where he would shatter the Medo-Persian Empire. But they became subjects to Alexander. And then, of course, Alexander died later, but they became subject still to the Greek Empire. And they had, they had a, his empire was split among four, four of his generals and two prominent ones, the the Ptolemies in the south and the Seleucids in the north fought each other and they came through Palestine while they did it. And they both were trying to establish control over Palestine as well. After that, you know what happens. Rome comes, conquers everybody. And by the time Jesus is here, then we find that Rome is in power and Rome lasts for a thousand years. So we're talking about over a thousand years. Hear me. Over a thousand years from the time that Jeremiah prophesied, before there was not a power over Israel. But then, of course, Israel was also scattered, and we know that they became a nation again in 1948. But I want to read uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, so you can go there with me. Now, God is speaking through Jeremiah. He's a prophet, so he is speaking the utterances of God, of course. <clears throat> and it's good for us to understand a little bit how God thinks and how he works. <clears throat> so that we don't become discouraged sometimes. But he is a God of new beginnings, and he sees things in context of eternity. And, and we need to understand that, that God, he, he's mindful of the situations we are in, but he's looking far beyond that. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, we've all, well, some of us who've had children and maybe we had to take them to the doctor. Maybe the doctor's going to have to do something that we know is going to cause a little pain. Maybe the child has to, or a little fear, maybe the child has uh, to have a shot or something like that. And if you're like me, I mean, I grieves, grieves my heart a little bit. I, I, I hate it that... But I also know that it's very momentary. I know that it will bring about good, and I know that it's just a momentary pain, just a little momentary suffering, and then it's going to pass and it's going to be over. And that's kind of how civilization of man is to God. You know, one day, a thousand years is like a single day to God. And we need to remember that because sometimes we think, well, you know, but God, why are you allowing this or why is this? And he's looking in the terms of eternity, you see. It's, it is, it's nothing in, in, in comparison to eternity. But now, listen, Jeremiah, here's, here's what Jeremiah had to tell the children of Israel, the children of Judah. He said, you're going into captivity because you've sinned against the Lord. It's too late. He's not going, you know, he's convinced you're not going to repent. So you're going into captivity and you're going to be serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Now, when you say 70 years, most of the people that heard that thinking, I will never see the light of day again as a free uh, Jew. I'm going to be subject all this time, you know, to Babylon. I'm going to die a subject to the king of Babylon. That's what they're thinking. Now, maybe what they didn't understand, because Jeremiah didn't go on to tell them, but they knew by the book of Daniel, that there was going to be another king that would come. Darius and the Medo-Persian Empire, and then Greece, and then Rome. So they were going to be subject for over a thousand years to somebody. They were not going to be able to be a sovereign nation for that period of time. Now, knowing all this, and knowing that they've been in rebellion, and God having made a judgment that they would go into captivity, and God already 
prophesying through Daniel that they would be in captivity through multiple kingdoms. God knew all of this. Yet here we find, in the midst of all this, before Babylon, now by this time, Nebuchadnezzar has already came in and burned the house. He's already came in and took the, the articles. Um, but he hasn't conquered Judah yet. And here, notice verse 11. Well, verse 10. For thus saith the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. But we understand the fulfillment of that was not that everybody got to come back, but that most of the people would stay under bondage past Nebuchadnezzar, past Babylon, to the Medo-Persian Empire, then Greek, and then Rome. But that he would allow a remnant to come back to the land. And we see that in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But now notice verse 11, what he says here. Even though God is angry with Judah, even though God, God is pronouncing a judgment against Judah, God is bring, is, is, uh, has ordained that Judah would go into captivity. Notice what he says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you future and a hope. Now that's what he's saying in the midst of all of this. Now, if you're a if you're a Jew at that time, and if you knew ahead of time, it's going to be 1,500 years before you ever become a or, or you know you won't become a sovereign nation actually for 2,500 years. You see, you would be thinking, well, that's kind of what about my plans for me right now? You'd be thinking about, but see, God looks in in terms of eternity. Now. In context with this, remember that he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They were in bondage there. And he brought them out on the first day of unleavened bread. And then he brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai. And three days before that they were to meet him at Mount Sinai, he told the people through Moses to consecrate themselves and prepare to meet the Lord. Because if you will obey his covenant, that he will make you a whole nation of priests. You will be a people to him. Well, we know that, that they didn't do that. They never became a nation of priests. They actually received a priesthood to be intercessors between them and God, the priesthood of, of uh, Levi. So they didn't enter that covenant. They backed away. But God gave them another covenant to hold them in place until the promised seed should come. The promised seed did come. And the promised seed died in 31 AD on the day of, on the Passover. And he was buried. And then he was risen as a wave sheaf was being offered. He ascended to, to the Father to be accepted. And when he was accepted, then the barley harvest was accepted by God. Now, then we find that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appeared to his disciples and other people, 500 people at one time, we see in, the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he, he told his disciples, his close ones, he said, now you tarry here. You wait in Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost. Now when he brought them to the foot of Sinai and he gave them the commandments and he offered them the, uh, the covenant of Abraham, that was on the day of Pentecost. Now, now, all this time later, he's offering the covenant again on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 Jews received it, you see, that day. And then more were added in time, and the church began to grow. So, here we find that in 31 AD, that the church began. Now, that is the beginning of the salvation of Israel. Now, not as a nation, not as a nation, but he's offering them the Holy Spirit. Now, if those Jews had not been scattered, had they not been under Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, Rome, their hearts would have never been prepared to receive that message. That's the truth of it. And God knew this ahead of time. So 
When he says here, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. He wasn't talking about uh, while they were in bondage to these other nations, even though he watched over them and he preserved them. But he was looking far ahead. He was looking to a point in time, even to this day, Pentecost, when he knew that he would pour out his spirit upon all of those who were there and they would preach to these Jews who were there for Pentecost from every nation under the sun. And he knew that some would receive that message. And when they asked, they said, what must we do? Let's go over to Acts chapter 2. What must we do? They heard the message. And you know, here's what happened. You know, Peter gave a sermon and he basically went through the history. He basically said, you've always been rebellious. You've always been rebellious. And God has always been faithful. And God sent his only son and you rejected him and you cried out for him to be killed. Verse 36, it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, both Lord and Christ, or Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord your God, our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified, he kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So... So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day they were added about 3,000 souls. And then they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So, you know, Peter reminded them of all that they'd been through, all the captivities they'd been through, and why? Because of... of, uh, rebellion against God, because they did not obey God. But even in all of this, long before, before before there was a captivity after Israel became a nation, before Babylon was allowed to come, God told Jeremiah to tell the people that I have good plans for you. It may look ominous. It may look like calamity. But I have eternal plans for you. And I have good plans. I'm not going to forsake you. I will always be there. Now let's go over to Leviticus chapter 23. The holy days reveal God's plan of salvation. And of course they're centered around three separate harvests. The first harvest is the barley harvest, which takes place during the days of unleavened bread. That is spiritual Israel. We're spiritual Israel. We, everyone who is born of the Spirit is spiritual Israel. We are the first fruits of God. We're a spiritual nation, a holy nation. We will rule the nations with Christ during the millennium. Now, natural Israel will be saved and preserved. And of course, Every every Israelite, of course, who receives Christ and receives the Holy Spirit, then they're a part of spiritual Israel. They're no longer a Jew. Remember what Paul said. It's not one who is a Jew outwardly, but it's one who is a Jew inwardly. And so, and in Christ, we know that we're neither Jew nor Greek. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so when a a Jew or an Israelite comes to Christ, they're no longer what they once were. Just like all of you who have been baptized and received the Holy Spirit, you are no longer what you once were. Now, you may not be exactly what you aspire to be yet. You know, uh, who is the man that wrote uh, Amazing Grace? 
He was a slave owner. You know, what was his name? Newton. That's right. It's Newton. And that was something he said. He said, well, uh, and he, he repented, you know, when he came to Christ. And uh, he said something to the effect is, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not what I want to be. But by the grace of God, I'm not what I once was, something like that. And that's a wonderful thing to remember. So we understand that there is a, um, you know, there's going to be physical Israelites, the Valley of Dry Bones. They're going to come up and um, they're going to rule. No, not going to rule, but they're going to teach all the rest of the nations God's way. But we will be kings and priests of a higher order of the priesthood of Melchizedek, and we will rule the nations, including Israel, with Jesus Christ. Now, here in um, uh, Leviticus chapter 23, let's just begin reading in verse 1, and we'll go all the way <clears throat> into uh, what it says about the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. The Lord spoke again to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed times are these. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. You notice it's not just a day of rest. But it is a day for a holy convocation, a time which we appear before the Lord. Because I, I mention that because <clears throat> there are, so, I have met some Sunday congregations who um, they, um, they come to the knowledge, uh, the truth of the Sabbath day, and they know they should keep it, but they know that most of their church members will not stay with them if they move their services from Sunday to Saturday. So what they generally do is they'll have like a, a Friday night service of some type, or they may just tell people to just rest on the Sabbath day, and then they have services on Sunday. But it's not just a day of complete rest. It is a holy convocation. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. Verse 4, these are the appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, that is between the evenings, is the Lord's Passover. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now, you understand, what, what we find here is that we eat unleavened bread during the time of the barley harvest. We could say it this way, the barley harvest, as in people, they are unleavened, as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we eat and feed of the unleavened manna, which is Jesus, from heaven. And I think it's a little bit telling when you have, I noticed uh, the United Methodist Church. I watch, almost every Sunday I watch their services and I watch Emmanuel Baptist services on Sunday morning just to see what they're doing. And uh, it's pretty interesting. But the uh, United Methodists, they have communion every single Sunday. And they actually have these leavened loaves of bread, big leavened loaves of bread, and they break off these and they hand it to people. So it's leavened, it's not even unleavened. And they dip it in this, this uh, golden cup, I guess it has grape juice in it, and, uh, and they partake of it. But, you know, it's not even unleavened. And I noticed that the wafers that the Catholics use, it's not unleavened either. But this is about us being unleavened, and Jesus is unleavened, and the barley harvest, the first fruits, the bride of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, the administration of God, the rule priesthood of the order of Melchizedek, 
is unleavened because leavening is the type for sin. Amen? So we are unleavened. Remember that. We're unleavened. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. And he said, remove the leaven from you. He's talking about a sinner that was in the congregation that was committing adultery or fornication. And uh, he said, you are in fact unleavened. So therefore, let us celebrate the feast of unleavened bread. You see, the feast during the barley harvest, the bread you eat is the barley bread, and it is unleavened. And that's your harvest. That's you. You're that harvest. And we are unleavened. But in contrast, the wheat harvest, there's two loaves. God commanded two loaves to be taken. Each loaf, one loaf represented the northern kingdom. One loaf represented the southern kingdom, Judah and Israel. And they were to be made of wheat, and they were leavened, you see. Because you're going to be leavened until, until you receive Christ, amen. Until you receive the unleavened manna from heaven into you. And so the, the bread that Jesus gave his disciples was the barley bread and it was unleavened. So it says here, in the first month, verse 5, on the 14th day of the month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is a feast of unleavened bread. There's a reason why God calls it that. Unleavened bread. This is the celebration. Therefore, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 5, therefore let us celebrate the feast. Let us rejoice. Let us celebrate. Now we're celebrating the fact that Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed and made us unleavened, and we have eaten that Passover, the unleavened body of Jesus. Therefore, we enter into this seven-day period, which, uh, which is, pictures our life from beginning to end, the completion of our life, unleavened. Amen? That is, without sin. Not because you've put the sin out, we have a part. I mean, he says, put the leavening out. But you know what you can put out? You, you, can, you can go in your cupboard and you can put out the bread. You, you can put out any yeast that you have in the house. You can physically put out those things that you can take a hold of and put away. But you cannot remove sin from your life. Only a righteous Savior shedding. The, the blood of animals could not remove sin from your life. Only Jesus and the blood of a righteous sacrifice has the power to remove sin from our lives. And he has done that. And so we enter into that, that feast of unleavened bread knowing that we are unleavened, that we are without sin, that we're without blemish, that we're perfect in the eyes of God. And that's the truth. Now, we don't do everything perfect, but we have a position where we are perfect. And that's what God looks at. So he says, on the 15th day of the same month, there's a feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation and you shall not do any laborious work. But for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. And on the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. It is a wonderful, holy, and joyous day on that seventh day because you have finished the race. You're ready to receive your crown. Amen. And then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land where I'm going to give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priests. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. you see that? Now we know that the sheaf represents Jesus. He's the wave sheaf. But when he's accepted, we're accepted. 
He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. This is the Sunday that during the days of unleavened bread. Now on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, one year old without defect, for a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall then be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering by fire to the Lord for a soothing aroma, with its drink offering a fourth of a hen of wine. Until this same day, until you have brought in the offering of your Lord, you shall, you shall eat neither bread nor roasted grain nor new growth. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations and all your dwelling places. Now notice verse 15. Now you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath. This is from the time that the wave sheaf is offered. You shall count from yourselves after the Sabbath from the day uh, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering. There shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. That's this day. So it's a feast of weeks, seven weeks plus a day. And then, of course, the New Testament calls it, calls it Pentecost because Pentecost in Greek means 50. Now notice verse 17. You shall bring in from your dwelling places two loaves of bread. This represents the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. For a wave offering made of two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. So now we find that there's two first fruits. There's the first fruits of God who are of the order of Melchizedek, who is the bride of Christ, who is the administration of God, who are first born from the dead or born again by the Spirit. That's the church of the living God unleavened before the Lord. And then you have the first fruits of the nations, which is natural Israel. And we'll see that uh, plainly when we get over to Romans chapter 9. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, though. Let's read that. I've been quoting it, but let's read it so it'll be... We'll have that image of those words in our mind. Here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, And this is talking about a man who is committing sexual sin in the congregation. In verse 6, it says, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? So see, we are not. The church is not leavened. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. So now, why are we unleavened? Notice it says, you are in fact unleavened. And you know that most of the churches that keep these, these feasts, they believe that this is a time that they are getting the leavening out of their life. That's what I was taught the whole time I was in Worldwide and the time I was in the, the uh, global church of God. Um, you know, we would strive to get all the leavening out of our house. I mean, we would dig, we would look at every uh, cranny, every crack, every you know, in our cars, down in the cushions, everywhere we could possibly find some some leavening and something like that. And we did that. And as we did that, we were thinking we need to be diligent, just as diligent in looking at ourselves and getting the sin out of our life. And it's not wrong with being diligent. It's not wrong with with paying attention to detail either. But I was pretty proud of myself. I noticed that, you know, when I was doing those type things. But here we find the fact we are already unleavened. So it's still that we put the things out of our home, but we ourselves are unleavened by the sacrifice of Christ. So we notice, just as you are in fact unleavened. Why? For Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed. And because of this, it says, therefore let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, 
but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, you know, there's a lot of people think they're celebrating the feast. Now, they got all the leavening out of their house, but they're still in the process of getting the leavening out of their, their life. That's what they think. You know, so they think that they have the power to get the leavening out of their life. So they, this day, yeah, we're, we're getting the leavening out of our life. Well, what we just read there, that we're celebrating the fact that we're not leavened. See, we can't, how do you celebrate the feast with leaven? How do you celebrate the feast of unleavened bread with leaven? With leavening. You don't. So read, let me read verse 8 again. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with the old leaven. That, that, now, that's not talking about just leaven bread. That's, that's not talking about yeast in your cabinet. That's talking about you. Because he's already said you are, in fact, unleavened. You, not your house, but you, yourself. Your temple is unleavened by the work of Christ on Passover. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and in truth. Now let's go over to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. All Israel will be saved, but it's important for us to understand that there is more than one Israel. Verse 1, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory of the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. So, Paul being a Jew himself, his heart was grieved by the fact that so many of his fellow countrymen had not received Christ as their Messiah. You know, matter of fact, he tried so hard, even though he was the apostle to the Gentiles, he tried so hard to bring some of his fellow Jews to Christ. And after a period of time, he just washed his hands of it and said, I'm going to the Gentiles. I mean, you're stubborn, you're stiff-necked, you're just not receiving it. So he says here, who are Israelites, the giving of the law, the temple service, the promises, those who are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, Christ being born of the tribe of Judah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So he's really discouraged about that. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, he says. Now notice, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Now we know that Israel is another name for Jacob. So if we read it this way, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Jacob. It helps us to understand a little bit better. Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But now notice this. Through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. And why Isaac? Because Isaac was the child of promise. Isaac was the child of promise. Jacob was not the child of promise. Isaac was the child of promise. God promised Abraham to give him a son in his old, old age. And Isaac was a fulfillment of that promise. And we are the children of promise. And so he says, now notice, they are not all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but it is through Isaac your descendants will be named. For that is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. And when you say children of the promise, you know, we're talking about children who are born of the promised seed. We see in, first, in Galatians chapter 3 that 
the promised seed came. The promised seed was Christ. And we're, when we're born of the Holy Spirit, we're born of the promised seed of Christ because we see like Peter said that even the Holy Spirit that spoke through the prophets was the Spirit of Jesus, was the Spirit of Christ. So there's a lot of people then that they put their stock into uh, the natural genealogy or the natural seed. It's not the natural seed, but it is the spiritual seed. The children of God, the true children of God are those who are born of the promised seed. That's why when Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again, he was saying it's not enough for you to be born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to be an heir. And let's think about that for just a minute. Let's not, not let that get past us. What does it mean to be an heir of God? Where God hold, withholds nothing from us. When we're baptized and we're born again, we become an heir of God. We're the firstborn. As the firstborn, we have the birthright, you see. Jesus is a firstborn from the grave, firstborn of many fruits. He always is the head, but we're his body. And we're heirs of everything. What is there on this earth that would you would trade that for? Really, think about it. What, is, what does the earth have well, it's all temporal for one thing, but what does the earth have, you know, that you would give up being an heir of all things? I mean, we don't even know. But I mean, God, I mean, God can speak into existence new things all the time, if you just think about it. But we are heirs. Now, the Bible says that over and over. Think about it. In Christ Jesus we are the sons of God and we're heirs of everything that he has, which is everything. Everything. Verse 25. As he also said to in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people. Again, he's speaking in context with um, it's that, see, he's talking to the Romans. Romans were Gentiles. And he's saying that if you're born again, if you're a child of the promise, you are a child of God. It's not the children of the flesh, he says, who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants, and we are heirs as those descendants. Verse 25, I will call on those who are not my people, my people. And her who was not beloved, I'll call beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, there shall be, they shall be called the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. Verse 30, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness obtained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at, it, at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. And if you think that you're getting the sin out of your life, that's works too. I mean, you're thinking you can't do that. All you can do is present a willing heart before the Lord and say, I, I lay down my will, Lord. I am unable, but where I am weak, you are strong. Just as it is written, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Now here in verse 1 of chapter uh, 10, Paul said, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify, testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness, they seek to establish their own. They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. And we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that 
Jesus gave us his righteousness. Chapter 11, verse 1 says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? Well, may it never be. For I too am an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says that in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and they have torn down your altars and I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, notice that. Then there also there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious, gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Verse 25 For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, but if we look back in chapter 10, verse 12, it says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's the key right there. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord that's who's going to be saved. So that fits with what he said, that a remnant would be saved. Now let's go over to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Now so we have the annual holy days, of course. We have uh, the Passover, and then we have the seven days of unleavened bread. That pictures a harvest of the barley. That's the first fruits of God who were first fruits, uh, who will be the first fruits of the Spirit. And then we have the um, Pentecost, which is the wheat harvest, and that pictures the future salvation and the establishment of, of Israel as the first fruits of the nations, and they'll teach the nations. And then we have the fall festivals of trumpets, the return of Christ, atonement, the putting away of Satan. And then we have the Feast of Tabernacles, which pictures the millennial reign of Christ. This is the third harvest, the vine and the produce. These are people who will learn God's way for the first time during the millennial reign. And then it carries on over to the last great day, which pictures the great white throne judgment, the second resurrection, where the books of the Bible will be open to those who had never had an opportunity to know God while they lived their life in the, in the flesh. And they'll rise up and they will learn God's way. And then they will, dis, you know, then they'll be judged by whether they obey God or whether they and they want to submit to God and be a part of his kingdom or not. And we understand that this is the way it's going to be because what Jesus said when he was pronouncing woes against some of the cities of Judah. And then he said, if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, wicked cities God had destroyed, they would have repented long ago. And he said this, they will rise up at judgment and condemn you. So we understand that when they learn the truth, they're going to uh, embrace the truth. Now, we're not speaking of 100%. We don't know how many, but as a rule, they will. Now here in Galatians chapter three, let's notice verse uh, seven. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Now, he's speaking to the Galatians. This is Gentile 
converts. They're not Jews. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Verse 12. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Now this is talking about the covenant based upon righteousness by law, which was the Sinai covenant. But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, if you had to produce your righteousness by the works of the law, you would be cursed because you would fail. Amen? So it says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. He's speaking to Gentiles. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are the Abraham's descendants and your heirs, heirs according to the promise. And then in chapter 6 of Galatians, notice verse 15. Paul says, For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation, a new creation, a new beginning. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them. And upon, notice, who he calls the Galatians who have received Christ, who have become a new creation. He calls them the Israel of God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now let's go over to Romans chapter 3. Abraham's covenant is one of faith. And if anyone here is watching that is not familiar with some of the things that I'm saying or the covenants, you can go to our website, pointsoftruth.com, pointsoftruth.com. Go to the booklet section and read the booklet, The Two Covenants, and it will better explain. Here in Romans chapter 3, we'll begin in verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Now, we already know, and the prophets have already prophesied that any righteousness that we have is just filthy rags. I mean, we can try to be righteous. We can try to do what is right, and we do. And we strive to do that. But we will always fall short in our effort, in our, you know, aspiring to, to obey God. Doesn't mean we don't aspire to obey Him. We should. But we have to have, you know, real, realistic expectations. I, most of my life, I had very unrealistic expectations. I was reading, thinking about recently about how people make New Year's resolutions and almost always they don't follow through with it. And uh, I was doing a little study on that and there's actually a psychological term for that. <laughs> and um, it, it has to do with... Uh, having, putting your hope in the wrong thing. It's, it's uh, having unrealistic expectations and also looking at yourself unrealistically. So people usually are quite, uh, uh, well, they try to 
they try to, you know, put their goals pretty lofty and they think that they can reach them. And it's not wrong to have lofty goals, but you know, when you think about the difference between a New Year's resolution, you're saying, okay, I'm making a New Year's resolution, therefore, this is what I'm going to accomplish. This is my goal for this year. But if you have a new beginning, then the focus is on just yielding and growing. Yeah, maybe you'll grow faster. Maybe you'd achieve more, you know? But if you don't, you wouldn't be discouraged. Your hopes wouldn't be dashed. And we have to have hope. That's what anchors us. Amen? And so we have to put our faith and our hope in that we have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ through faith. Because if we just look at ourselves, we'll never, and if we honestly judge ourselves by what we do and how we are, what we say, what we think, we will know that's not the righteousness of God. We'll know that. Because we will say and think and do the very things that we hate from time to time. Amen? So even during those times, we have to, by faith, which believes the impossible, sees the invisible, that our righteousness is still there because of the work of Jesus. So let's read it again. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being manifested, witnessed by the law and the prophets. Understand that God told Moses that keeping the law will be righteousness to you. And then Moses at the end of his life said, no one ever did it. That's what he said. But there's another coming who is greater than me. Even the righteousness of God, verse 22, through faith in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Now, this tells us something. Now, the Gentiles did not have the law of Moses. They, they did not have the law of Moses. And they became righteous without ever knowing the law of Moses or ever walking, fulfilling the law of Moses. And at the council at Jerusalem, when certain Pharisees who had believed stood up and said, these Gentiles have to be circumcised and directed to keep the whole law of Moses or they cannot be saved, the judgment was, you're wrong. That's what the judgment was. So their righteousness came by faith in the righteous one. Now notice, for all have sinned and all have fall, fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter whether you're Gentile or Jew, we've all sinned, we've all fallen short. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Through, and that, you know, yet justification means that you have now been given a life without a record of any sins. And that's a gift from God. And it comes because he's being gracious to you. He's given you something that you cannot do yourself. You cannot produce yourself. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So Jesus is just. And being just, he became the justifier of all of us who have faith in him. Where then is the boasting? And that's the thing. Uh, we can't boast because we haven't produced this in ourselves. Where is the boasting? Well, it is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No. But by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And this, is, again, is in context with a covenant that was given at Sinai by which your righteousness would come from your ability 
are your deeds of keeping those laws, which no one was able to do. Doesn't mean you don't try to. Just means you're not able to. We all like to see our children try to do something that they are not able to do, to strive. I mean, if you, if you never try to do anything you're not able to do, you'll never learn what you can do, amen? I remember one time uh, this uh, young woman won a skating competition. I don't know if it was in, in the Olympics or not, but the announcer was just saying, you know, how is it? How did you learn to be so good at what you do, being that great a skater? And she said, well, every time I fell down, I got up. <laughs> that the, the secret to her success was keep on keeping on. Uh, she fell down lots of times. And you know, you'll never be defeated unless you stay down. You cannot be defeated. There's not going to be a point system. You know, now you're in a boxing match. You could you can get outpointed. You can last the whole 15 rounds and you know and get you know just get completely beat up and and everything, but never get knocked out and stay down. But that's not the way this this works. This fight is a fight to where if you if you keep getting up, then you're going to win the, win the fight. That's what it's about. Here in uh, chapter 4, verse 6, just as David, David also speaks of the blessing on the man whom God credits righteousness apart from works. It was always there. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man who, whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Now see, it's not that, you know, these things are not committed, but God doesn't take them into account. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised but while uncircumcised. And he's saying this because circumcision is the initiation into Judaism. If you're going to go keep the whole law, keep all the laws of 613 laws uh, um, of Judaism, the first step is not baptism, it is circumcision. How then was it credited while Abraham was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to him. Of course, all circumcision is is removal of the flesh. That's it. It's just a symbol of removing of the flesh. That's it. And there is no law that you could ever keep that would remove the flesh. Amen? There's, it's impossible. It takes the spirit of the living God in order to remove the flesh. We must be born again. And the father of the circumcision, to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also those, those who follow in the steps of of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are in the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. Now think about Abraham. I mean, Abraham lived in the most prominent city in the world, the city of Ur. It was, uh, had no enemies at the time, lived in peace, very prosperous. The average home was 14 rooms, two stories, indoor plumbing. It was a very special, very, very special city. There was no wall there because they didn't need a wall because they had no enemies at the time. 
And God told Abraham, who was a prominent citizen there, according to Josephus, was an astronomer and studied the stars and came to believe that there was a creator of those stars and began to seek God, the creator of all. And God called him, come out, come out. Now, he didn't tell him where he was going. The Bible says Abraham did not know where he was going, but he knew he was falling. He knew who was calling him, and he put his faith in him. And that God does that to, to us sometimes. He, he may tell us to step out. We, we may not know where we're going, we may, but we have to just trust him, amen? Put our trust in him. He has good plans for us. Then maybe he'll lead us through Babylon. <laughs> maybe after Babylon, we'll go through Medo-Persia. Maybe after Medo-Persia, we'll have to endure Greece. Maybe after Greece, we may have to endure Rome. But sooner or later, Pentecost will come. Sooner or later, the new beginning will happen. Amen? We just have to have faith. I mean, the Israelites waited a long time. But Pentecost did come. And the Holy Spirit did descend. The church began. And spiritual Israel, as far as the New Testament was concerned, uh, was born. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, we'll begin at uh, read verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Now, you think about what was the Sinai covenant. I mean, what did God say? You know, you, I'll give you a land flowing with milk and honey. I will bless you there. You know, I, I will rebuke the devourer. I will heal you of your diseases. But what, what is the hope? What did Abraham hope in? Abraham hoped in the city whose architect and builder was God, the golden city, the city of the heavenly Jerusalem. He looked for a heavenly country. That's what we see in Hebrews chapter 11. That's what those who were born of the Spirit, even before the church the age of the church. They were born of the Spirit. That's what they put their hope in. So he says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he also he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Now it goes on to explain the covenant, that I'll make a covenant, a new covenant with them. It's not like the one I made with them when I brought them out of Egypt in the wilderness, but I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds. I will remember their lawless deeds no more. I will be merciful to them. Verse 13, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is already ready to disappear. Now chapter 10, verse 14 for by one offering he has per perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Think about it for a moment. Let it sink in. For by one offering he has made perfect for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is a covenant that I will make with them, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind, and I will write them. And he's not writing them on tablets of stone and putting them inside of a box anymore. He's putting them in our hearts. And their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. When The fact that we don't give sin offerings we don't give blood offerings, guilt offerings. That should tell us. We're not commanded to do that. And that's because we already have forgiveness. And where there is forgiveness, there is no more offering. See, God the Father offered Jesus. Jesus laid down his life as the Lamb of God. We received that offering once and for all. Therefore, brethren, 
that means now that we understand that that's the position that we have in Christ. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence, and that gives us confidence. If you, if you go through the days of unleavened bread thinking, boy, I still got a lot of sin in me that I got to get out, you see. Now, you can be thinking about, you know, I need to be, I need to be more uh, diligent about my prayers. I need to, you know, read my Bible more. I need to be more careful how I, I speak. You know, I, I need to guard my eyes or my ears. I got, watch what I do a little bit. That's, those things are fine. That's just a part of walking in the Spirit, you see. But if you think that somehow that, that if you have a sin, that you can, you can get it out yourself, that you somehow can wash that sin away, what are you going to wash it away with? Mr. Clean won't work. I mean, what are you going to wash? Oxy, yeah, the oxy, the, whatever that stuff is I see on TV, that won't work either. It's not going to work. There's only one thing that washes sin away, and that's the blood of Jesus. Amen? You can scrub on it all you want to, you know. You get in your mind, you don't want, I'm going to remove this sin. It won't work. <laughs> you think that's funny, don't you, Ashley? Therefore, brethren, and I'll tell you something else. Joy won't work. Dishwashing detergent won't work. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, that's how, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, it's a new beginning. And it's a new way, which is inaugurated for us through the veil, which is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, can you, the, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He stands there and says, you can't enter. There's no way you can enter. That's the flesh, of torn flesh of my Savior Jesus there. I'm entering. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. What do we put our hope in? And don't waver. For he who promises faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, we, we also understand this began, the Great Commission. You know, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, you know, go into all the world, preach this gospel, and baptize those who receive it, and teach them all that I taught you. And then he told them also in Acts chapter 1, I want you to stay in Jerusalem until Pentecost. Because when Pentecost comes, you're going to be you're going to receive power from on high. And the Holy Spirit did fall, and the gospel was preached by Peter. 3,000 people were saved, and then it just spread from there, and the, the church began by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so for us, that's what it means for us. It's a reminder also that we are spiritual Israel, that we're heirs of all things, and that God has, forsake, has not forsaken his natural people, and that Israel will be saved as the first fruits of the nations to be an example to the other nations so that they would learn God's way through them. But you understand that even during the millennium, people are, there's going to be sacrifices made. That tells us that they will have not received the sacrifice of Jesus, of course, or there would be no more sacrifices because that's what we find in the book of Hebrews that, you know, where Christ has been sacrificed, there is no need for any other sacrifices. So there's going to be a thousand years of that. And then, of course, we'll have the second resurrection, the great white throne judgment, and God the Father will eventually come after creating the new heavens and a new earth. Thank you.